Good evening, everyone. I think there's uh, several people on now, which is good. Uh, this is the fourth or fifth RM Jones webinar for this winter. We've done a couple on livestock, one on sheep, a couple on crops. Um, and this one tonight is around lambing and keeping lambs healthy and improving your profits. Uh, we have two speakers this evening joining us. Uh, both from Cargill's. I'm just trying to find their resume so I can just go through where they are. So our first speaker tonight will be Helen Rogers, who's our Cargill technical sales manager, gives us support from Cargill's on all things lamb milk related. Uh, Helen has a degree in veterinary science from Liverpool University and then a further diploma in ruminant nutrition from Harper Adams and has been on farm and worked previously with Romanco and came to us a number of times to support farmers on farm, uh, has 12 years experience of doing that and now works for Cargill. Our second speaker is Bianca Theruth, again from Cargill and Bianca works in technology application and she has both undergrad and postgrad degrees in ag. Uh, and has worked in South Africa for several years before coming back to the UK, uh, mostly driven by the improvements in the weather, I would think, not. Uh, and has worked for BOCM Pauls and Volac before joining Cargills and bringing all her vast amounts of knowledge into young stock and specialising in young lambs and calves. So before we go any further, there's a couple of housekeeping points. You're all muted and you're all hidden from view. We don't want to all see you eating your dinner and tea. At the top of the screen, you'll notice there's a little pop out, a little speech bubble. If you want to ask any questions, just click on that and you'll be able to enter your question anytime you want. And um, we'll, we'll ask that out. We may well do them all at the end of each session. There'll be two sessions, which we'll aim to finish by about quarter past eight. Otherwise, what you can do is text message me or Tom on 07972252559. And if you need to ask that again, I'll give that out again later on so everyone's got it. So in the meantime, I'm going to pass over to our first speaker, Helen. I don't know if she's ready. Hopefully she's ready. Hi, John. Hi, everybody. My name's Helen. Um, and as John said, I work for Cargill. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight. Bear with me one second while I just share my screen. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight a little bit about um, healthy lambs, healthy profits um, and some of the, the solutions that, that we work with um, Downland and RM Jones to, to develop. So can you see my slides OK? Yeah, I'm going to take, yeah. take that as a yes. Yeah, it's all there <laughs> and they're up and in presentation form. Bad. Right, well, I will go ahead. Um, yeah, as John said, if you can pop your questions in the chat box, that will be a little bit easier. Um, as now I'm presenting, it's a bit difficult to uh, to see them and John can hopefully catch them all and then we can we can go through them. So let's start off. So lambing time, it is that sort of the most critical time really for you guys as sheep farmers in your calendar. Um, but it is responsible for 75% of ewe deaths um, and around 70% of lamb deaths. And obviously, I'm sure you guys know well, also most of the costs during your, your farming year. Um, if we look at those, those sort of uh, losses and as, a, as a UK whole, we're finding that at the moment we're working on an average lamb mortality of 15% um, and an average ewe mortality of 5%, which... I bet if you actually think about it, that's probably higher than you would expect as a, as a national average. Um, and if you break those down into kind of monetary terms, if you think a dead lamb could be worth £120 at the moment, if not more, uh, went in conservative with £120. Um, if you've got 100 ewes and you got a 176% lambing you lost you were at that average you were average farmer um, and you lost 15 percent of your lambs that works out was 26 lambs and at that 120 pound cost that's just over three grand that you're losing out of your back pocket um so as you can imagine it is uh, uh something that we're all quite keen to help you improve um 
And if you think of, a, of the cost of a U, say £120 replacement cost, you know, you, you might argue that that might be a little bit more for some of you, especially the, the pedigree guys. You're going to pay somebody £20 to get rid of her at least. Um, then you're going to have to spend £30 or more, depending on whether you buy your milk powder from RM Jones or not, on uh, rearing her lambs per head and then all the extra work that's involved the extra time how many of you actually cost in your time um when you're when you're actually doing your sums and your costs on the farm now when you look at, at lamb mortality and we kind of focus in a little bit more on the the reasons behind it um you can actually find that a lot of them are preventable through management or, you know, we can at least re reduce them. Um, if you, This is a, a study done at Aberystwyth University a while ago, but it's still kind of seen as quite relevant um, to, to what UK farmers are finding at the moment. Um, and if you look at it, you can find that around a third of them are actually um, down to third of the that's something, again, we know that we can influence. Um, another third down to a, a abortion and stillbirth, arguably something we could have a, an influence on with the management of the lamb. Um, then the next one down, 16% of them are misadventure and, or predators, which always kind of misadventure. adventure. Um, but, you know, if you think about, again, this is something we could influence because if you've got strong, vigorous lambs that... Uh, you know, uh, up and about as soon as they're, they're born, then they're less likely to get picked off by predators, aren't they? Um, so again, this is something that that we can have a, an influence on. Now, I wanted in quickly on one of the main causes of when we break it down into the infectious disease is one of the main causes um, of poor performance and quite often death. Um, amongst lambs as it is something that we can work with you to help you tackle um, on farm. So watering mouth, I'm sure a lot of you will have come across it at some point, obviously, you know, much more prevalent in those guys that are, are lambing inside, but it is caused by E. coli bacteria. So that can that can be prevalent in the field, in the soil outside. So it is majority of the time in a, a house lambing issue but it, it's not un, it's not unknown not unheard of it to be to happen outside as well because it is that e coli infection that's causing it um it's most common in lambs between sort of 12 to 36 hours old and much more common in twins and triplets obviously these are generally you know the smaller lambs quite often they're a little bit more vulnerable and they don't always get as much colostrum as a as a single would so what symptoms are you going to see if you've got lambs that have got watery mouth? Uh, the clue is kind of in the name, as you can see from the picture there. They do salivate a lot. You get a lot of, of saliva and a wet mouth. They're often got a very cold, wet muzzle. Um, and those lambs will just look very, very sad. They will separate themselves off. They won't want to get up and, and suckle. They will be sitting there, ears down, looking sad. Um, it is watery mouse often known in some areas as uh, rattle belly because when you if you this sounds odd but if you pick up a lamb with watery mouth and you shake them gently their stomach will rumble their stomach will rattle um, and that stomach is is often very very swollen as well you can find some lambs that do have that do scour but that isn't always the case um, and quite a lot of the time you will lose lambs that that do suffer from watery mouth if you don't treat them uh, within a, a timely manner. Now, this is one that we can prevent by good management practices. Make sure your bedding obviously is clean and dry. Make sure you you know you you're using a good bedding disinfectant, um, bedding conditioner in between. You're cleaning out pens as you're moving from batches of lambs. All those sorts of things, you know, those sorts of common sense things. But obviously, it is a little bit more difficult. I appreciate once you get towards the end of lambing as well, you've got that that infection build up you and the staff everybody's tired um you know it, it is it i appreciate it is that little bit more difficult to keep on top of things and quite often you will find that you will start off the lambing season with no problems then it's towards the end of the season that you, these infections do start to creep in um other things you can do is making sure you treat enables with strong iodine make sure it is it is the 10 percent stuff um, or a, a suitable umbilical spray and 
without stealing Bianca's thunder, good colostrum management obviously is is really, really important to make sure that those lambs have got everything they need to fight any infections they meet. And also giving them, uh, treating them with a, a pre and a probiotic to just help get help get that, that gut working and all those good bacteria that can help um, keep the gut healthy and fight off any infections that those lambs may come across. Now, when we think about those um, reasons for lamb mortality, another th area we have to focus in on is actually the pre-lambing period and what happens to the ewe, because that period, that last sort of six week period has a huge influence on the, the way those lambs are born and the condition those lambs are born in. Um, so 75% of lamb growth occurs in the final six weeks. So that is an absolutely huge amount of growth. Uh, eight weeks, eight weeks pre lambing, your average uh, a four kilo lamb will weigh eight hundred grams. The the fetus will weigh eight hundred grams. So if you think that lamb, this is what it looks like. That little thing that looks a little bit like an alien. Um, that is what an eight week uh, pre eight week pre lambing fetus looks like. And in that eight weeks, that lamb has got to get to a four kilo living kicking breathing healthy bright lamb that you expect to see on the floor of your shed or on the floor of of your field so as you can imagine that is it's a huge ask and it's going to take a, a huge amount of energy and protein and nutrition from that you to to look after that lamb and, and give it that growth especially if she's carrying multiples so these two are two of my favorite slides to to show uh, they i think they're great um because you can't answer me back, I am going to assume that when I ask the question of do what do you think that big black thing um, on two thirds of this picture is, that I'm going to assume that, that you are going to answer rumen because this here is a, a it's a, a dead you, a barren you. Um, she's been frozen and she's been cut in half. And that big black circle there, big black sort of oval is her rumen. So you can see that that takes up around two thirds of her body size of her abdomen. So you can see how much how much food she can fit in and obviously how much energy and protein and nutrients she's going to get from her diet. So she's perfectly happy. She has no problems, really. Now, this is the same picture from a you that is 100 days gestation gestation. So she's just coming up to that critical sort of last six, seven weeks um, of pregnancy. Now, again, because I can't hear you shouting at me, I'm going to assume that you all know, you all answer the question of what is the red thing at the bottom of your, uh, of the, that you can see at the bottom of the picture of the U, that that is, that is her two lambs. So you can see now that the thing, the, the big black part that you saw on the, the first picture now is squashed right down to a tiny, tiny amount um, her rumen is completely, completely squashed by those two lambs. And again, if you've got if you've got triplets, this will be even more so. But equally, if you've got single lambs, that lamb still takes up an awful lot of room in her abdomen, and her her, um, her rumen is com is much, much compressed. Um, I mean, so, I just, as you can... sorry, I just, John, I, jump in. Can I make a just comment on there? That's yeah. a hundred days gestation, so yes. there's another fifty days to go on that. Yeah. And the main bulk of growth. Wow. So getting nutrition right yeah. in the last three, four weeks of lambing is absolutely crucial. Exactly. Spot on, John. You can see how much how much less food she can fit in, but she's just coming up to the most one of the most energy demanding periods of her of her life. So you what you feed those ewes in that last sort of six week period really, really is the key to keeping her healthy, making sure you don't lose her and also keeping those lambs inside healthy so that they're born strong, they're born vigorous. And if we don't, if we aren't able to meet those requirements and it does happen through, you know, no, it's not all it's quite often not through pharma fault. You know, it, these things happen. Um, we are expecting these like these use to do an awful lot. This is when we end up with issues like twin lamb disease. Um, so this is basically uh, when she has not got enough energy to meet both her requirements and her lambs requirements. 
it's known as twin lamb disease because it is much more prevalent in ewes that are carrying multiple lambs. Obviously, they have twice the energy requirement or three times the the, the energy drain as a, a single carrying ewe. And a lot of it comes down to the fact that she can't eat enough anymore to supply the energy that she needs because that rumen is so, so compressed. Um, and this means that she starts to break down her own body fat and her own muscle to use for, for energy and for nutrition. Now, this will work for a few days, but it is quite inefficient. Um, and it also, the liver really, really can't cope when she starts to do this. Um, the liver, she when she does break down her own body fat, any of you that have done a um, an Atkins diet or that sort of keto, um, keto diet, this is basically what you're doing. You are breaking down your own body tissue, your own body fat, but it, it's not very, it, it's not that efficient and it can't, after a, a, more than a few days, um, it can make the your you quite sick because she can't, her liver can't cope with all of the, the things that are produced um, when she, she produces energy this way. So it does tend to make her very, very sick. Um, what sort of symptoms will you see if you've got use with twin lamb disease? First thing is they will separate themselves off. You will see her at the other end of the field or the opposite end of the shed. And how even if you go with feed, whether you go, you go in with cake, whether you go in with fresh buckets, whatever, she won't come and feed. She's she's really thoroughly miserable and she will just stay in her own. Um, you will see that she is very dull. She's, she looks depressed. Usually their ears are drop, have dropped. Um, if they're inside, you will see like this bottom picture, bottom right picture. They quite often head press. So they literally will go into the corner against the wall and just lean against the wall with the, with the head against it um, and just stay there. Quite often, if you can get close to her, you'll find that she, she she's also shaking around her head um, and her shoulder area. After a while, if you if you if you haven't treated them, they can go blind. Um, and then eventually, if they're not treated, if they don't get the energy that they need, then you can lose them. Now, this is the point where I've scared you all with lots of statistics on uh, mortality, lamb mortality, you mortality. Now, funnily enough, we have products in the range available through RM Jones where we can we can help you with these things. So the first one I wanted to, to mention is at the Downland Lamb Force Twin Lamb. So this is uh, an energy supplement, an energy liquid, um, as it says on the tin, for use at risk of twin lamb disease. Um, it's a really, really nice high energy supplement. There's quite a few other bits and bobs in there that are really there to help a, in those twin lamb disease to, um, periods to get that energy level up, but also any other periods of stress or illness. It doesn't have to be just for, for twin lamb disease. This is a really nice store cupboard product that you should have in the in the cupboard. If you've got any ill sheep at any point in the year, if you've got tups when they come out after after tupping, when the, they're a little bit knackered, this is quite a nice thing to just give them a quick pick me up when you take them out because it is really, really high energy got all the vitamins and trace elements that they need um, and also a lot of, of liver support in there. So it is very, very fast, very, very fast acting. Um, you Once you do supplement use with this, quite often they can be up within a few hours. Um, in here, we have got multiple sources of energy to, to really help her completely recover. Um, it's not just a quick hit. So we've got dextrose in there, that which is that very, very immediately available energy. This within a few minutes will help to, she will start to feel it. Um, it's used very, very quickly. She will start to feel a little bit better. Then we also have molasses in there, which is kind of a medium term energy. And this, the key to this is also that it's really, really palatable as well. So it does help with with administration and help her help her. Actually, it's it's not it's actually fairly pleasant for her to take. And then also we have glycol in there. Now, this is a longer term energy. So this with a with a few feeds of, of with a couple of feeds of the twin lamb, this will also help her actually reduce the amount of of body fat that she needs to to start breaking down so you've got a nice three step of energy in this product to help her immediately get up and about and also help get her back on her feet um, and help her metabolism start to to get back on back on track um as well as the energy side um 
We also have a couple of, of other supporting um, additions in there. So we've got betaine in there, which will actually help to stop, again, help stop her having to break down the body fat that, that she's using for energy. And also our own um, Cargill technology called Lift. Now, this is our liver support pack. Um, as I mentioned before, when she's got twin lamb disease and she's breaking down her body fat, it is it, it puts a lot of stress on her liver. Um, it means that the liver can clog up with fat and it actually stops working, hence why she can get so so sick. Um, so the, the lift pack in there really helps support that liver, helps clear any fat away that is actually started to build up in there. And so, you know, if her liver's working, then her whole metabolism, all her body functions are going to be much more efficient and she's going to start to feel better much more quickly. We have got a lot of a, a good supply of trace elements and vitamins in there as well, um, again, to help her immunity, to help her metabolism, just help her uh, feel a little bit, a little bit happier and a little bit more um, back on track and healthy. Um, another thing about this product is it is really, really easy to administer. There's a spout in the bottle um, that you can use. You just pull it out the top and then just give it 50 mils, one squeeze directly into the used mouth as soon as you start to see those symptoms. I would say we we tend to say as soon as you start to see symptoms, but equally this can be used as a as a nice sort of preventative that if you've got triplets or quads even or any use that are sort of very thin, um, aren't at the right body condition, you know, using it sort of regularly as a as a bit of a preventative through the through the that last few weeks of lambing can really help just keep them on track and give them that extra support um so it is a nice store cover product not just for those lamb those ewes that are looking very sick equally it can be helped be used as a as a preventative for you as well and that, then the second product i wanted to to mention before we hand over to bianca um is our lamb force lamb boost now this is a similar sort of similar idea um, from an energy point of view to the, the twin lamb product for use, but this is specially formulated for newborn lambs. Again, really nice high energy supplement, but we've also got a nice pack in there to help support their gut, help support gut health, especially for those lambs that are at risk of bacterial infection. Now, this is one of those things where I am not allowed to write it down but uh, we're not allowed to print it anywhere. RM Jones can't print it anywhere, but this product is aimed at helping with, helping to prevent watery mouth infection. The, the, the people at the VMD don't allow us to write that anywhere, but I can tell you, I can have the conversation with you that this is aimed at, at helping to reduce the risk. Um, as well as having that good supply of energy, there's also um, egg proteins in there, that do provide um, help provide some immune support against uh, any specifically against E. coli infection. Um, so it is really, really useful for those for those flocks that have had um, watery mouth infections in the past. It is quite a nice store cupboard one to use to help give those lambs once they're on the, once they hit the ground, give them that little bit extra support um, and hopefully help prevent any any infections. As I, as I mentioned, it's a nice high energy supplement. We've got a lot of highly digestible fat in there, so it can be used really, really quickly. Um, this will help increase, help that lamb kickstart its metabolism and also help it use its brown fat reserves. So brown fat, everybody thinks of as, right, lambs have brown fat, then that gives them all the energy they need for the first sort of six to 12 hours of life. Well, brown fat actually only makes up around two to four percent of a lamb's body weight so it's actually although it is a good very very quickly and it uses a lot of energy there's not very much of it and if you've got lambs that are born to a ewe who is quite thin they will have less brown fat as well so we can't actually rely on brown fat as the only energy source so having a product like this in the in the cupboard is really is a really good idea a lot of people will use it as just as a little kickstart anyway as a routine for all lambs but especially those if you've got if you've got any of the 
particularly cold or again multiples um, that are much more likely to to need that little bit of extra extra help with getting up and about in that first few hours this is a product um, as i mentioned we've got the egg proteins in there to help us help us um, fight off um, e coli infection um, then we also have a prebiotic as well. So the a prebiotic is one of those little is the is the the um, feed the gut bacteria. So it'll help. It'll it's everything that the that your good bacteria in your gut wants to to eat to to grow um, and help protect the the gut. And for something like watery mouth, that's really really important because that E. coli infection comes is is comes into the into the animal's gut and that those bacteria um actually attack it from from the the site of the gut so if you've got a good support of of good of healthy bacteria natural bacteria in your lamb's gut then they are much more likely to be able to fight off those infections so by having the egg proteins and the prebiotic in there you've got a kind of two-pronged approach to really giving that lamb some support um, against any infections that it finds out when it's when it's born and it's on the ground in the shed um, we also have um, an antioxidant, a natural antioxidant in there as well, which again will help support the immune system to give them that little bit extra, extra support when they they do if they do come across any any infections in the shed, and again some immune supporting vitamins as well. Now this is another one that's really really easy to use. We appreciate that you don't want to be faffing around with lots of little little bottles and and dosing lambs with all sorts of stuff. So this one it comes in a little pump bottle. It is literally put the spout in the side of the lamb's mouth and one pump will give on straight onto the lamb's tongue will give it the two mils that it needs um really really easy as i say i would keep this in personally as a stalk of a product to use for any lambs that are weak or have had a difficult birth or are, have got if they're outside have got a little bit cold um, and wet and are looking a little bit sad but the other the the main key to this product is that it can really help us with reducing that use of antibiotics um there's a, a an awful lot of focus on this now the you it has been the last few years obviously for for yourselves out there but this year it looks as though they're really really going to be cracking down on the use of spectam antibiotics for things like watery mouth it has quite often in the past been used as a preventative measure rather than just a treatment for um, lambs that are infected with E. coli. So again, this is something by using a product such as Lamb Boost, you can help reduce your potentially reduce your use of antibiotics and, and be that little bit more responsible um, and have a but also have an effective way to, to help keep your lambs healthy. So with that, I am going to hand over to Bianca. Um, and she can carry on with a little bit more information for you. Um, as we said before, if, you, if you've got any questions for me, um, pop, you can pop them in the chat box or pop them over to John by text. OK, well, we, we have a few questions already. Um, so there's uh, I've got four or five, actually, uh, one online, okay. a couple of text ones. So we'll go through those now and then have Bianca okay. come on after that, if that's OK. Yeah, perfect. OK, so. One of the first ones was when it comes to you nutrition and getting that right and i'm not it doesn't tie fully onto this the question was some ewes don't lick their lambs heads first and obviously they end up suffocating yeah can improving nutrition make a difference on that that is a difficult one but you could argue that it will have it, good nutrition could have an influence because if that if she's well fed pre-lambing then she's more likely to have strong vigorous lambs that will get up very quickly so even if you know you mum is a little bit in the way and mum's stifling lamb a little bit if those lambs are strong and they want to get up and suckle then you've just got that little bit more chance rather than if you've got a load of lambs that are sitting there a little bit sad and they're not they're not vigorous they're not waiting to get up and about then if mum is a little bit overzealous and can get in the way then they're going to be a lot more likely to to suffer than those lambs that are fighting fit and ready to get up and about okay um 
second question was on on, the, on my text was I mix a twin lamb drink with warm water and put it in the buckets in the lambing pens. Am I wasting my time or is that a good thing to do? Um, no, actually, I think that can be a, a good thing to do as a sort of preventative measure is a little bit of extra support i would say if you've got anything that does look like it is suffering if you've got any use that do look like they are they they are they definitely have got they're not right then i would make sure that you give that feed directly to that you um but if you do want to use it kind of more for say for all of your all of your multiples say or you know all of your you use that are a little bit thinner then doing that sort of thing can be can be quite a nice little extra support for them it is super palatable as well so by adding it to the water um what i would say is probably if you're going to do that probably put it in a, a smaller volume of water to make sure that they do drink it um and you're not chucking half of it away when you chuck the bucket away in the morning um but yeah it is a as an extra that is that is perfectly fine to do but if you've got anything that is suffering i would make sure you feed that straight away yeah um mark eckley has asked what probiotic do you recommend do iron jones provide we provide the best in the world mark <laughs> but i'm sure hanning will go through that well that might actually be something that bianca may be able to answer actually bianca i'm going to drop this one on you <laughs> <laughs> because it may i think that sort of thing uh, actually may may well be covered within part of bianca's uh presentation okay well we'll come back to that one then when uh, <laughs> bianca goes through this and the the last question which is just coming through on a text which was uh this is from jake okay. and he has asked with the the probiotic or with the um lamb i've forgotten the name of it now i should Boost. know it Lamb boost, um, obviously for watery mouth, but he's also asked, does it work on joint till? Would it have any impact on joint till in lambs? Uh, I suppose it is. It's all that sort of link. It's all linked in terms of that immunity and helping that lamb fight off infection. Um, joint till, you couldn't, I, I wouldn't like to say that this product would have a direct impact on that sort of thing on joint till um uh, it's that that's it is designed for the watery mouth sort of e coli gut infection um but you know the the antioxidant in there um the prebiotic the vitamins in there they will all equally the energy they will all help with getting that lamb's immune system up and running as quickly as possible so you know along with good colostrum management and good hygiene then all these things work together to help reduce risk of infection from various different sources so uh, I, I hope that didn't sound like too much of a cop out but <laughs> my answer would be that you know you are still helping support that immune system but you couldn't necessarily i wouldn't necessarily recommend this as a direct uh, product that would directly influence something like joint I suppose the root the root of joint hill infection is probably different to um yeah, exactly water, definitely it's come yeah. from other other sources. Yeah. Um I think that's all the questions that I have at the moment. Just to remind everyone at the top of the screen you have a little speech bubble. If you click on that and you want to ask any questions, please feel free to stick them in there. Alternatively give me a text or send me a text on 07972 I should have a piece of paper held up, shouldn't I? So you could all read the number off. Um, but in the meantime, we're going to pass over to Bianca and Bianca, who's got a fantastic background, is going to talk us through her uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I just need the slide deck to be shared again. Um, so that I could take control if that's OK. Do you want me to share mine, Bianca? Uh, yes, please, or or I can. It's I can I can pull it up here and it might be easier. Come on, um, just wing it. Just wing it. <laughs> I probably could just wing it. Um, uh, just bear with me. I spent my life winging it. <laughs> um, John, can you confirm you can see my screen? I can, yeah. Yeah, okay. it's all in Perfect. presentation mode as well. OK, excellent. Thank you. Um, thank you, John, for the warm introduction at the start of the meeting and to all of you on the call um, that um, have given up uh, part of your evening um, on a Tuesday. 
uh, to uh, listen to Helen and ourselves, really appreciate it. Um, the title of my talk is Optimizing Health and Performance for Lambing Success. Um, Helen's given us a, a great introduction and I'm going to sort of follow on um, with some of the facts and figures and averages um, at the start of this presentation. And we'll be focusing uh, primarily on a colostrum um, as well as lamb milk. Um, as I'm in presentation mode, I won't be able to see um, any questions come through. John, but please feel free uh, to stop me um, either sort of um, during the presentation or if you want to save the questions uh, till the end, I'm absolutely fine with that as well. Um, so Helen has set the scene really nicely when um, she discussed neonatal lamb mortality. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate the importance of it because I think the neonatal lamb mortality statistic is quite important. Um, and a paper that was published by Cathy Dwyer um, and a group of other researchers um, up at Edinburgh Uni back in 2016 actually looked at a global perspective on neonatal lamb mortality and what they found, you know, sort of going back as um, as far as 1970, right up until 2014, was that overall there was a 15 percent um, mortality when it came to neonatal lambs, you know, and this would either be sort of, you know, at the point of lambing um, or lambs that actually didn't make it past um, the post weaning stage. So losses that occurred, you know, certainly in the first six weeks. And it really got me thinking, when you look at all the advancements that we've made when it comes to um, sheep production and ewe nutrition and management, why has this rate remained stubbornly un unchanged when, when you think about all the knowledge um, and everything that we have, you know, at our disposal um, that we maybe didn't have, you know, sort of 40 years ago in the, in the 1970s? And I'm going to come back to possible reasons for that, but I just want to give you um, a really quick uh, example or a really quick analogy from the mobile phone industry. And I'm sure if I was standing in front of you all this evening and I asked you for a show of hands of how many people had a smartphone, I would probably, you know, sort of put good money on it that 99% um, of the people on this call would have uh, a smartphone, whether it be an Apple or whether it be a Samsung or, you know, sort of another mobile phone provider. Most of us around would have um, a smartphone. So if you can cast your mind back to 2017, when Apple released the new iPhone 6 and Samsung released their new model of the Samsung Galaxy, um, it may surprise you to know that Apple had a failure rate of 29% on the iPhone 6 and Samsung had a failure rate of 34% on their Galaxy. Now, that was probably the worst year um, certainly for, for Samsung in terms of failure rate, uh, but also for Apple. Um, and as sort of future generations, you know, um, of the iPhone 6 and, you know, we moved on to the iPhone 7 and 8 um, and as well as, you know, sort of later editions of the Samsung Galaxy, that failure rate dramatically decreased from sort of 29 and 34% right down to 3 and 4%. And the failure rate was related to, you know, poor battery life, calls dropping out, um, not being able to sort of do all the features and benefits of a smartphone with apps crashing um, or sending messages. Now, the mobile phone industry refused to accept a failure rate of 29 and 34% respectively. So, why do we accept a failure rate of 15% when it comes to neonatal lamb mortality? And I mentioned just a few moments ago, you know, considering all the knowledge um, that's at our disposal um, and all the information that we know today that we might not have known back in 1970, what has resulted in this remaining um, stubbornly unchanged? Um, and when John introduced me at the start, you know, he introduced my title as technology application specialist. And what we work, what I work on, um, what I spend a lot of my time doing, you know, be be it calf um, or be it lamb, is actually taking all the results of the research um, that we do from experiments that we conduct at research centres, and how we apply that research practically on farm, make it user friendly, make it easy to incorporate, you know, in the day to day running um, and management when it comes to lambing. 
So a possible explanation for why that mortality rate has remained stubbornly un unchanged is that sometimes the science can't be translated into something that's easy to apply on farm and something that's practical to apply. Um, and it also got me thinking as well, you know, sometimes you you visit farms where where people are doing things very well um, and they've certainly thought out of the box and they've been quite creative and innovative, you know, sort of with their solutions and their ideas. And that's not necessarily documented, you know, in a textbook or out of a out of a research paper or certainly, you know, anything that goes into the print media. So they may be making advances. And for some reason, that information isn't being shared with the rest of the industry or, or isn't sort of funneling down. So that could be a possible reason for why these um, neonatal lamb mortality rates have been quite stubborn. And then more importantly is, you know, sometimes with labor and if there, you know, Helen mentioned it's a particularly stressful time when it comes to lambing um, and labor is always, you know, one of those resources in addition to space um, that be can become quite limiting. Um, and it could be a case, you know, of, of if you've got a, um, a workforce um, that are all involved in, in lambing, everyone's going to do things a different way, or perhaps it's just you and you can't be, you know, everything to everyone, you know, during this particular period when it's um, a lot going on. Um, and, you know, sometimes things do slip. So the point I'm trying to get across is that there's going to be no sort of uh, one area that we can pinpoint why uh, neonatal lamb mortality has remained stubbornly unchanged. And I do believe that, you know, some some of these factors, you know, are either present on farm, either sort of um, one by one or in combination uh, with each other. But they certainly all will have an impact um, on on um, trying to reduce that um, average uh, neonatal lamb mortality. And I'll come back to the example that I said a few moments ago. If the mobile phone industry, you know, um, got their act together and will not accept, you know, rates of sort of 29 to 34%, um, we can certainly take a leaf out of their book and see what we can do to try and improve that. And Helen did touch on some of the um, the areas that we can look at in addition to nutrition and management and environment, you know, alongside a good colostrum uh, program um, and also ensuring that you use a, a good quality lamb milk replacer um, and also are offering a good quality um, lamb creep or lamb starter. So just to put things into perspective, you know, looking at actually where do these losses occur and trying to make every lamb count, 70% of losses associated um, with pre-weaned lambs or sort of with lambs at birth are, you know, sort of losses at birth, losses post uh, pre-weaning and losses post-weaning. And that represents, you know, sort of about 70% when it comes to losses. Helen did touch, you know, some of those losses, you know, that we may lose uh, between scamming and la scanning and lambing, and that accounts for about 30%. But that remaining 70% is largely within our control. Um, and certainly we can look at making sure that the feed and the environment, and when I talk environment, I'm, I'm using the term quite loosely and quite broadly, because environment can be things, you know, it's not just limited to things like the building and the ventilation and the bedding. Um, it'll also take into account, you know, sort of disease and pathogen, um, stocking density, um, as well as management. So in terms of some KPIs um, of, of where we should really be targeting, and I'm not sure how many of, of you on the call are actually sort of monitoring and measuring um, and managing, um, but these are some of the, you know, the data that has uh, been published in terms of giving us some guidelines of where we should be aiming. Um, and when we look at, you know, lamb losses um, from birth to turnout, we're looking at an industry target of less than 5% you know, certainly not the 15% that we currently have at the moment. Um, and when we talk about uh, pre-weaning and post-weaning growth rates, um, it was uh, particularly challenging to try and find information related um, to growth rates by breed. Um, so the numbers that I have above for pre-weaning and post-weaning growth rates um, are a combination of various sources. And we're kind of aiming for a pre-weaning growth rate of 250 to 400 grams per day and a post-weaning growth rate of less 
of greater than 100 grams per day. Now, again, um, in addition to recording some of these KPIs, I'm not sure how many of you are weighing um, during the pre-weaning process. And as we get towards the end of the presentation, I will share some, some data with you um, from one of the units in Herefordshire, um, an RM Jones customer, where we've conducted a lamb weighing trial uh, for the last couple of years. So in terms of what are our objectives, you know, certainly pre-weaning and going into the post-weaning phase is that we want to be able to supply the lamb with energy and protein for maintenance, growth and health. We don't want to be treating sick animals. We don't want to be treating animals that are not going to thrive um, and not going to grow because all of that we're providing um, in the form of milk replacer and lamb creep. Um, is going to then be channeled into fighting infection um, and certainly not growing great and healthy lambs. So we need to make sure that from a nutrient requirement perspective, uh, the lamb has everything that it needs to be able to thrive and grow um, and certainly be healthy. Now, this is also an efficient phase for daily, daily live weight gain in terms of feed conversion. Um, it's often said, you know, uh, during the pre-weaning period, the feed conversion is quite high. You know, we're kind of looking um, sort of, you know, um, 50 to 55 grams worth of growth for every 100 grams of feed that we're supplying. And once that animal is then weaned, that feed conversion efficiency drops quite quickly. Um, in addition to, you know, ensuring that we provide, you know, a good quality um, lamb milk and lamb creep, this is also quite an important period to stimulate optimal rumen development. So it's kind of balancing um, both really. So we want to capitalize on that early pre-weaning growth potential, but we also want to grow the rumen at the same time to ensure that we don't have a post-weaning growth check. And sometimes those two uh, work um, in opposites. Uh, so certainly, you know, if we are um, feeding lambs ad lib, we need to have, you know, sort of a weaning strategy to ensure that when those animal that they those animals are ready to wean, and when we wean, they don't suddenly fall off a cliff uh, because the rumen's not adequately developed or prepared to go on to um, a solid feed. This is also a critical window of opportunity. Helen highlighted some of the health challenges that we have during this period. If anything can go wrong, it often does. Um, and this is quite a stressful time on farm anyway, with many of you being sleep deprived um, and you're trying to juggle a lot of things, you know, in addition to lambing, keeping on top of the cleaning and the feeding and all the other responsibilities that come to, you know, come with the day to day running of a farm. Um, and in addition to providing um, a good quality diet, uh, we also need to provide an environment that is dry, draft free, well ventilated, um, and that's also bedded regularly um, to ensure that you know we don't we don't then have challenges related to uh, respiratory and scour because the environment um, is not clean. So moving on to um, colostrum um, and why colostrum is so important. Um, and why it really is a race against the clock. Um, I'm sure all of us on the call are aware um, that there's no transfer of antibodies across the placenta in young ruminants, not just lambs, calves as well. Um, and that is just because of the way um, the, the uh, fetal cells and the maternal cells are separated. There's about three layers um, on either side. Um, so it makes it very difficult for these um, antibodies um, to actually pass through the placenta because um, they just too big to be able to do so. So we've got other nutrients that can cross the placenta. So in terms of things like protein and energy and all your vitamins and minerals, they can move across the placenta. Um, but when it comes to um, um, antibodies, because of the, the structure, um, they're not able to pass through the placenta, which is why we place such a huge emphasis on feeding good quality, clean colostrum as quickly after birth as possible. Um, so I'm sure we can all agree that colostrum is the first thick yellow milk which is produced after lambing and contains the following. So immunoglobulins, which are going to provide maternal protection um, to the young lamb until it can start make it, until it can start making its own antibodies, depending on what it's been exposed to. Um, and that usually sort of occurs um, in the first sort of um, week or two of life. Um, it also contains leukocytes, so to be able to, you know, sort of um, deal with any invading pathogens um, and being able to destroy them quickly. Um, and 
what's becoming of more and more interest is these non nutritive biologically active factors and non-specific antimicrobial factors, because these have been um, linked to um, developing the gastrointestinal tract um, and also linked to having an impact on uh, future lifetime production. So what do we mean by successful transfer of immunity in lambs? Well, we want to ensure that the lamb consume sufficient mass of IgG in the colostrum and successfully absorbs a sufficient portion of IgG into the circulation. Now, from a calf perspective, I am talking to um, our dairy farmers um, about monitoring colostrum, um, bleeding calves to, you know, to assess how successful passive transfer of immunity is. I've yet to come across um, some farms that are actually doing this from a lamb perspective. So when I was trying to find some numbers of what's acceptable in passive transfer, it was a little bit difficult um, to actually get some numbers together. Um, but, you know, to sort of give you a guideline, we're looking at a minimum of 30 grams of IgG, certainly in the first 24 hours. Um, and obviously that's going to be, um, you know, sort of made up of a number of, of small feeds in the first 24 hours, you know, unlike calves, where you'll be able to sort of give two or four litres in one go. And for those people, if there are, is anyone on the call that's actually bled lambs to see how successful passive transfer is, we're looking at a serum IgG of greater than 15 mg per mil, a serum total protein of greater than 5.5, and if you're doing ZSTs, you know, greater than 20 units. And when we're troubleshooting on farm, you know, when it comes to um, challenges in the pre-weaning period um, related to disease. Um, the first questions I'm going to ask, and Helen touched on this in her presentation, is how have we fed and managed um, that you, you know, sort of leading up to the last trimester of pregnancy? You know, has energy been limiting? Has protein been limiting? Because all of those will have an impact on colostrum quality. Um, and then sort of following on from that, you know, has the lamb uh, been given good quality colostrum quickly enough of it um, and is it clean? Has it been harvested in a clean way? Has it been fed out um, in a clean way? And many of us are familiar with either the four cues or the five cues of colostrum management relating to quality, quantity, quickly quantifying it. So actually sort of bleeding um, lambs to assess how successful passive transfer is. And then the final cue, cleanliness. So although maternal colostrum is best, um, and we will always advocate that maternal colostrum be fed um, in, in, in most situations, there are times when maternal colostrum can't be fed, and that's generally related to the quality of that maternal colostrum. So it just doesn't meet the standard, uh, which means it's not good enough to feed, or if there's a disease um, uh, risk on farm um, and we want to break the cycle, um, then we need to look at, or, or perhaps my ewe just hasn't produced good quality colostrum or she hasn't produced enough of it, or if there's triplets, you know, and we just don't have enough to go around. There are instances when sometimes um, maternal colostrum, you know, although it's best, the option is not available or fairly limited. Um, and that's where a product like uh, Lamb Force Premium Colostrum can certainly come in. Um, and this product is a complementary water-soluble colostrum for new lambs, which is designed to complement or replace maternal colostrum when it's in short supply. Um, and the benefits associated with that is um, it contains the process technology. Um, and in the next few slides, I am going to go into that in a bit more detail, but it certainly covers some of the elements that Helen highlighted uh, with some of the other products that we have available for young lambs. So we want to provide, you know, certainly the colostrum source needs to provide essential protein and energy, very quick sort very quick source of energy. It needs to be readily available and easily digested by the young lamb. Um, it also needs to, to mix easy, um, and we need to also use ingredients from digestible sources, which it does. And it's also designed to support the establishment of a healthy immune system, and that's related to the process technology. And as I said, I will go through that in more detail. So the feed rate is to mix 25 grams in 75 mils of water. Um, at 40 degrees, and you need to feed within six hours after birth. And this, in addition to the the other products that Helen mentioned, really needs to be a staple in the in the lambing kit. Um, so when things do go wrong um, and there's not enough maternal colostrum, uh, we can certainly um, supplement or replace maternal colostrum. 
Um, and now sort of moving away from colostrum and focusing a bit more on, on the lamb milk. Um, some of you have been using um, the Downland Lamb Force for some time. Um, so just going through um, some of the features and the benefits. Um, the, we use a ewe milk protein source. Um, and the idea behind using that is that we're affording sort of maternal antibody protection, um, you know, being fed to these young lambs. Um, some of the other features of the product is that, you know, in terms of mixability, palatability and consistency, it certainly does meet the criteria there to be able to support high quality performance. As these are young ruminants, consistency is absolutely key. And we do need the product to mix out, which it does, um, and be easy to feed um, and readily taken up by the young lamb. You know, certainly you don't have time to be faffing with a with a lamb milk that's not going to mix or lambs that are slow to drink or not eager to drink. Um, and then the final feature I want to highlight is around the processed. Um, and we're going to talk about that in a bit more detail, but really to improve gut health and performance. As Helen mentioned, as an industry, we are under pressure to reduce our dependency um, on antibiotics, you know, due to antimicrobial resistance, but also to find, you know, other opportunities uh, to be able to um, take a proactive approach to health and wellness without the use of just blanket treating. And we do know, you know, there are some instances where if there's a problem on farm, um, you know, medication will be put into the feed. Um, but in my opinion, you know, we're not really getting to the root cause of the problem. And this is where, you know, additives can certainly help um, as a proactive and preventative approach. Or, you know, if we do have, you know, sort of disease um, on farm or challenges, you know, as Helen mentioned, it can certainly help and support um, the, the young lamb through an already challenging time. So just quickly on the specification of the product, it's a 23% protein, 25% oil. Um, it's um, got a shelf life of 18 months from manufacture. And we have um, a standard version available for those of you who are using um, a shepherdess feeder or a bucket feeder. And for those that are using the um, Brit mix feeder, feeder which, which seems to be quite common on farm, we do have a free flow version um, available as well. So Helen's touched on elements of processed um, and a few moments ago I talked about the processed technology that's contained um, in the downland colostrum um, and processed is a technology that's only found in the downland neonatal range which is manufactured by Cargill and processed really is a gut conditioner which is aimed at increasing feed intake supporting and developing the young lamb and we developed processed you know back in the early 2000s when we knew that um, uh, medication was going to be withdrawn from feed um, as part of the, the new EU uh, rules and regulations. So with that in mind, we had to look at, you know, what natural alternatives um, could we, we look at enhancing performance or um, natural alternatives to antibiotics. And that is how Prozest, you know, certainly came about. So very much tried and tested um, and has been in the market um, and incorporated into uh, the Downland lamb milk uh, replacer, as well as some of the other neonatal technologies. So what is process? Just very quickly, because I am going to be going into the into this into a bit more detail on the next slides. Um, an essential oil blend. It contains prebiotics, um, as well as a flavor, natural antioxidants, um, as well as a full profile of vitamins and minerals. So what do these different components actually do? Well, I talked about it containing a blend of essential oils, and you can see from the diagram on the right, it's um, common herbs and spices that you would find um, in your kitchen. So things like rosemary and garlic and coriander and, or and oregano. Um, and these essential oils really have an oil intestine. So how they actually work is that they manage the microflora because they create an unfavorable environment for pathogens to attach onto the small intestine and actually cause damage to the cell um, and to the wall, which means that they can then get out into the circulating bloodstream um, and cause all sorts of chaos. Um, so we're managing the microflora by creating an unfavorable environment for these um, pathogens to survive in. And in doing so, we also improve immune function because 70 to 80% of the immune system 
lives in the gut. So what we're doing is certainly nourishing the gut um, and trying to find proactive preventative ways to making sure that we don't suddenly have um, an overload of pathogens or nasty sort of bacteria um, causing chaos and, and, and um, upheaval in the small intestine and then making our lambs, you know, certainly sick. Um, the third function is to improve digestive function, because if I've got a small intestine that's um, healthy and, you know, I've got um, a good blend of, you know, sort of good bacteria um, that are keeping um, certainly the bad bacteria in check, it means that the nutrition that I'm providing to the lamb in the form of milk and creep feed is going to be utilized efficiently and all of that is going to be converted into growth rather than mounting an immune response and fighting infection and dealing with the chaos that that um, happens when we've got, um, you know, sort of a pathogen challenge on the loose. And then finally, it also works by improving the physical barrier. Um, so it certainly does strengthen it um, and does prevent, um, uh, it keeps the, the order and the balance and does prevent, you know, the, the chaos uh, that could potentially um, uh, happen with a with a pathogen um, outbreak. Now, one of the questions was raised around which uh, probiotic um, should we use? Um, we we aren't allowed to actually use probiotics um, in lamb milk replacers, um, and the reason for that is that they're not registered for use in lambs. So, from a calf perspective, we would be using Lactobacillus species as the probiotic. But from a lamb perspective, uh, what we add is the prebiotic. And that's certainly, you know, in some of the products that Helen mentioned, um, is part of the downland colostrum and is also in the lamb force um, milk replacer. But we can't use a prebiotic. So we can't introduce the beneficial bacteria into the gut uh, because those products are not licensed for use um, in lambs. But if you remember from a few slides ago, I said that those essential oils manage, you know, the microflora and they stimulate the growth of the good bacteria. And what the prebiotic does is that it provides a food source to feed that good bacteria. So, you know, for, for that good bacteria and for that microbiome to be in sync and to be in harmony, we certainly do need to provide uh, nutrients to encourage um, that beneficial bacteria pro proliferation. Um, the prebiotic also enhances the action, you know, certainly of the gut tissues. Again, it also works to improve the intestinal physical barrier um, and help stimulate the growth of the beneficial bacteria and certainly keep um, the negative bacteria in check. So overall, improving um, lamb health. Um, and then another feature of it is related to the antioxidants. Um, so uh, uh, potential times when the um, antioxidant and pro-oxidant balance can be disrupted. So you can see from the diagram on the left, you know, we've got a protective environment where the antioxidant and the pro and pro-oxidants um, are balanced, but sometimes that environment can become toxic um, and suddenly that balance is swayed and disrupted. And events that could actually cause that disruption, you know, are related to weaning, um, are related to perhaps regrouping or even, you know, difficult lambing, you know, where the lambs really had a, a tough time in addition to the ewe um, or, you know, sort of it could be um, around weaning. Um, so what we're trying to do with the natural antioxidants is to prevent that balance from tipping in the wrong direction, which means that we've got a lot of free radicals being produced, which means that this is going to be damaging the cell. Um, so how these natural antioxidants work is to keep everything in balance. So, you know, it certainly does have a, a role to play in regenerating. And it's also a partial vitamin E replacer, which is going to help, you know, certainly with strengthening um, the immune system. And finally, we also have a yeast that's part um, of the package in the lamb force milk replacer. And how the yeast work is by modifying the gut microbiota. So we want to encourage the beneficial of good bacteria establishing in the small intestine. And in doing so, we also prevent pathogen attachment. And all of this works to stimulate immunity, which means that we've got enhanced disease resistance, um, reduced digestive upset and improved growth um, and a feed conversion ratio, which means my lamb can concentrate on converting that feed into growth rather than using that feed to fight um, disease and infection off. So sharing with you some of the uh, positive benefits of having ProZest in, 
this was a, a lamb feeding trial that we conducted. Um, and we looked, uh, we had a control group, so a group that wasn't fed the processed, and then we had the treatment group that did have the processed included in the um, lamb milk. And we looked at, we monitored those lambs, you know, in terms of weights um, and in terms of the benefit of daily live weight gain, we saw a 15% increase in growth um, against the control animals. So, you know, I mentioned that uh, with the pressure on the industry of us not being able to use antibiotic growth promoters, we need to um, certainly look at uh, what natural um, alternatives and solutions and additives that we could have at our disposal um, to help naturally um, increase growth rates and improve feed conversion efficiency um, and process, you know, certainly does fit that bill. Um, so in terms of the benefits, we want to minimize disease challenge. We want to improve intestinal health. We want to enhance digestion. Um, we want to stimulate starter intake and certainly improve daily gain and feed conversion. Um, and just as we draw to a close, I want to share with you um, some data that we conducted um, from a unit in Herefordshire. Uh, so this was for the 2021 lambing season and they used the downland lamb free flow um, uh, lamb milk, um, and we had 46 lambs on the feeder. I should just say um, that this unit only puts lambs on the feeder um, if there's a sort of specific reason. So, you know, whether it was a triplet or whether it wasn't doing very well, um, so it got taken away from its mom and then put on the automatic feeder. Um, we conducted, uh, the trial was conducted between April and June, and we had various weighing intervals. Um, they currently wean at six weeks because that's what the machine says, but I am told the lambs were good enough to actually wean at five weeks because they were certainly heavy um, and performing quite well. And we didn't record any lamb mortality um, on the automatic feeder, but I did remove two lambs uh, from the data I'm going to show you now uh, due to poor, poor performance. So in terms of um, looking at the performance, you know, certainly what's highlighted in the green box, um, the pre-weaning, post-weaning and overall lamb growth rates certainly are well above uh, the KPIs or the suggestions um, that I presented um, at the start of the, um, the presentation. Um, and those lambs, you know, certainly um, did well um, and the, the customer was quite pleased um, that in combination, you know, certainly with a good uh, lambing season last year and good weather, the lambs were really able to thrive and perform um, on the downland lamb milk. We also got them to test some colostrum for us just out of curiosity. Um, so we gave them a BRICS refractometer. So we had 19 samples tested from primiparous and multiparous ewes with the single twin and triplet lambs. Um, I must say this farm had exceptional colostrum in 2020, um, and they've also had um, good colostrum in 2021. So we had 14 samples above 32% on the bricks, uh, 14 samples between 22 to 30% bricks, um, and the cutoff that we work to is anything below 22% bricks. So we only had one sample that was actually below that. Um, so again, great testament to good um, you nutrition in the last trimester of pregnancy, and certainly the way we the way we manage and handle that you up to the point of lambing, um, certainly all um, factored into making good quality maternal colostrum. Um, and with that, John, um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Bianca. That was very informative. There's a lot of information in there to digest and go through, much like the milk powder, I guess, once it's in the lamb. Um, <laughs> I had one question from Jake uh, on a text, which was along the lines of, do any of our competitor milks or any other companies have access to ProZest in their milk powder? Uh, no, uh, ProZest very much uh, is a is a cargo technology um, that is used by Downland. Uh, so no other competitors will have um, a package like ProZest. Some may, John, have a single component. So they may have an essential oil or they may have the prebiotic or they may have the antioxidant. But to to the best of my knowledge, no one really has a packet a package that actually targets um, gut health the way we do. So you know you've got the essential oils um, that certainly help um, in the small intestine. Uh, you're then providing the prebiotic to feed the good. Uh, the beneficial bacteria. Uh, you've then got the antioxidant, um, and of course, you've got the yeast. So, 
to the best of my knowledge, no one has a package like Prozest. They might have single components. Okay. Um, so essentially the, the downland milk supply for everyone out there, downland milk powder is the one to have, definitely. <laughs> Yes, and I'm. when it comes to additives and when it comes to looking at sort of um, uh, natural approaches to gut health, very few companies will actually have data out there. Um, and the fact that we have data on processed, you know, so it's not like I'm coming to you and saying, this is a magic white powder, John, it's going to sort out all your problems. I'm coming to you with that, but I've also got data to prove uh, the performance benefits as well. Quick question for this is my question. I was when we were going through your talk, you had five C's of colostrum. One of them was cleanliness. It's a word I've never seen before. What does that mean? It's related, it's cleanliness. So it's just a play on words. Um, okay. So what we mean by cleanliness is cleanliness. So, you know, um, making sure that if we're going to be milking uh, the ewe out, that the udder is clean and prepped, um, that your hands are clean, um, that the vessel that it's going into is clean. Um, if we're feeding it in a bottle, that it's clean if we're using a tube feeder. Um, so the, the cleanliness aspect of the, the five cues, you know, really relates to good practice and good hygiene around um, everything to do with colostrum, right from um, harvesting it to feeding it out, you know, to washing up the um, the colostrum feeding equipment afterwards. Uh, I have got one more question that's come on our text, which is, do I get the same impact of colostrum by tubing it uh, that I would get if I bottle fed it? Um, that's a, a certainly an interesting question, and um, if uh, if we look to some of the the calf data that's studied this quite extensively, um, some of the calf data found that there was no difference in the um, um, absorption efficiency um, of the aminoglobulins, you know, whether we tube fed or whether we bottle fed. Um, I know there are two school two schools of thought out there. You know, some farmers feel that. Um, you know, bottle feeding colostrum is a lot more natural because they're able to suckle. Um, and that means that the colostrum will go down into the abomasum. Whereas when you're tubing it, um, it kind of goes into the reticular rumen. It doesn't go all the way into the abomasum and then spills over into the um, into the abomasum from the reticular rumen. Um, my take on that, John, is whatever way we deliver colostrum, whether it's going to be a bottle or whether it's going to be a tube, what I need to do is get good quality, clean uh, colostrum into those calves as quickly as possible. And I've got to make sure that the process is not stressful. So sometimes with the tube, it can be a little bit fiddly um, and you, you've got to make sure that you don't pierce the lung or cause distress to the lamb. So whatever method that you're going to um, feed the colostrum in, just make sure that it's consistent and just make sure that it's not going to be stressful and it's clean. Um, and if you know, if you prefer to bottle feed, that's great. Um, if you prefer to tube feed and know how much you're giving to the lamb, that's also great. But choose one method and do it properly. Yeah, tubing lambs is quite an exciting event anyway. So <laughs> you've got to, doing it properly is quite crucial. I've had yeah. my fair share of disasters doing that, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't got any more questions come on my text and there's nothing online. If anyone has any more questions, you can use the speech bubble at the top and type them in and we'll give you sort of 30 seconds to type anything in um in the meantime i'll just go through that we have some more webinars coming up over the next month or two and we also have some crop based ones as well if you're interested please keep me in contact with either one of the farm centers or myself carwin or john pask and we'll be able to update you on any things that are going on um i can't see anything else come up so all i can say now is Thank you very much to both Helen and Bianca for the last hour. It's been very informative. There's been lots of information through there. We will make this available either on our Facebook site or YouTube, as far as I understand. So if anyone wants to go back and there's any particular points they want to pull out, they can do that off the YouTube clips or video clips and also get in contact with us and we can uh, put you in contact with Helen or Bianca and discuss any sort of finer details that you wanted to go through. But in the meantime, Thank you very much, ladies. Very, very appreciative for you this evening. And uh, we look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Thanks for having us. It's been a pleasure. In the meantime, we're going to close the meeting now. Good night, everybody. Go and get some dinner. Bye-bye. <laughs>